you're turning, I want to begin with that important statement that I've said about six times now. What is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. In his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Today we're going to hit on God being unchangeable. And as the reality of God shapes every asset of our, every aspect of our life, it shapes us from sin to suffering, from grace to glory. It shapes us in church, in business, at home, in our prayer closet. If all of God shapes who we are, the question I have for us today is how does God's unchangeableness change how we live our life? And particularly, I want to focus on the same concern they have in Malachi. What do we do with the two things that are most ubiquitous in the world? Sin and suffering. And I don't mean sins we commit. We commit plenty of those. I mean when we're sinned against and when we suffer. We see it every day. We have family members. Uh, Lo, I was in the post office Friday to overhear a conversation with the post lady and a woman who confessed that she hadn't talked to her sister in 10 years and she was about to go kill her. What do you do when you're one of those sisters? And you've been sinned against and you've suffered for it. What do you do in our country? Do I really need to chase that rabbit trail? I think it's something that we see very clearly. What do you do in the world? This, the last hundred years, has seen more Christian persecution than any other time in church history. We feel it. And we look at all of these episodes... And we say with our passage, they say, where is the God of justice? If God's law is unchanging, if God is unchanging, then where is he? I want to pick that up in our sermon in a sentence. Because the Lord does not change, we have not been consumed. Let's pray, and then we'll read our passage. Heavenly Father, your word is true. God breathed, fit to equip the man of God. It is perfect in every way, and not a jot nor tittle will pass. And it's upon your word that we build our trust. So would you help me to preach it clearly? And would you help us to hear the voice of Christ speaking through it clearly? that we may build our lives upon your unchangeable word. Father, we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Church, we're in Malachi chapter 2, verse 17. Hear the word of the Lord. You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. And he delights in him. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and make them and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless. 
against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word this morning. Let's begin by clarifying exactly what the Spirit is saying through Malachi. For starters, Israel has been oppressed by a foreign power, and they do not see restoration happening on their schedule. They've been oppressed. They've gone from government to government, leader to leader, but their case hasn't changed. God has promised a deliverance, but they are very much of the mindset of that old commercial that says, it's my money and I want it now. God's not operating on their timetable. And we understand that, don't we? I think of illnesses. I think of my friend MJ with his cancer and what the doctors have told him. You're in the fight against cancer. You're battling cancer. Do you notice how when we discuss diseases, we use military, military terms? Because an illness is a foreign agent in our body. It's not natural. It's not according to God's intended design. We want them gone. And we want them now. And we can apply that to a whole host of issues to the two sisters and the post office, to squabbles among our country, persecution of our brothers across the sea. We want it to stop. We want it to stop now. And our little grumbles and our complaints, they weary God. They weary God. They say all sorts of things about God. I can remember during inventory season at Lowe's, how employees would make sure to grumble just slightly louder when I walked by. Why? They wanted me to know how much they were not enjoying themselves. Our grumbling is the same way. Where are you, God? Hello? Are you asleep at the wheel? Where's all the justice you speak of, God? And God responds to them the same way he does to us. By means of promise. Chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, he promises the coming of John the Baptist. He promises the coming of the messenger of the covenant of grace of Jesus Christ suddenly into the temple. And to use the language of John, Jesus will baptize with the Spirit and with fire. And we've seen that, haven't we? In his life, in his death, in his resurrection, we have seen him cleansing and purging. We have seen the experience of his mercy. We have seen the experience of his wrath. All that he promises us in this passage. But what does he ground this promise in? It's in verse 6. He says, to this foundation we hope. When I use the word hope, I don't, I don't mean wishful thinking. I mean faith that looks into the future. Why do they... Why do we have a hope? He says, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed. Affliction has not consumed God's people. Injustice has not consumed God's people. Curse has not condemned God's people. God has not changed in his person or in his promises. He has not improved, his plans have not improved, his person has not improved, his mind has not changed, his love has not dallied. Every ounce of hope we have in sin and suffering is grounded on the fact that God does not change. Now, how do we take this truth that seems very abstract and conceptual, and how do we apply this? How does this impact us on a daily life? Before we can, let me make it concrete for us this morning by asking a different question. 
How do you and I change? How do you and I change? Well, one, we grow. We improve. I love, we have, I think, five kids here that play piano, and I love going to the recitals twice a year because every time I go, they're better. They're improving. They're changing. Now, for everybody else besides them, we're changing as well. We're growing older. We're growing older. We're breaking down. Jessica's stepmother loves to tell me, Zach, if it don't hurt, it don't work. Her knees hurt, her back hurts, everything hurts. Every time we grab a bottle of Aleve, every time we put on a knee brace, every time we pay an insurance bill, we are reminded that we're changing, that we're decaying. But even more than that, there's forces beyond our control that blow us off path. Many of you here are familiar that the mosses went to the Caribbean two or three weeks ago. They planned to have a lovely vacation, and three days into their vacation, this guy named Hurricane Beryl decided to go through the Caribbean, and suddenly they had to change their plans. I think of George Matheson. He aspired to be a great theologian, but he's going blind. He can't help that. And then his fiance does his fiance does not want to be married to a blind man. He can't compel her to stay. And his life is utterly changed by forces he cannot control. Are any of these true about God? Any of them. We can say on one hand, God does not change. God does not improve because God is perfect. Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And we know that perfection excludes change. I look at the men in this room and I know some of you are awfully brave. Sometimes I'm brave. And when Jessica's cooking my favorite dish and she's contemplating a change in the recipe, I walk in the kitchen in a moment of bravery and say, you shouldn't do that. And she looks at me, and what's the, what, 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 what do we say instinctively? Well, you can't improve on perfection. In the same way, if God could get faster, smarter, stronger, if God could improve in any way, he is not perfect. Scripture is emphatic. His ways are perfect. His word is perfect. He is perfect. God does not change because he's perfect, but he's also perpetually perfect. As I said weeks ago, God is simple. God doesn't have parts. He doesn't have parts that need to be replaced and, and break down. I think of our church family. How many of us have had replaced hips and replaced knees? We break down. We decay. That is not the same with God. He is the Lord, Yahweh, self-existent. He cannot diminish nor decay in any way. If you like to follow sports like I do, you take a great player like Michael Jordan. In his early career, he was very physical, getting in the paint, pushing people aside. But as he grew older, his body could not play that way anymore. So he developed a jump shot, and he shot three-pointers, and he passed the ball more. He's having to change his technique because he himself is changing. Do we see that in Scripture? James chapter 1 says, Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there is no shadow of change. Every gift from the foundation of the world to this very moment has come from the same God in the same way. He does not need to accommodate, acclimate, or compensate for any decay or diminishment. He doesn't change. He's perpetually perfect. He's powerfully 
perpetually perfect. We are dust and ashes. And isn't it amazing how many things can change our day? A flat tire, someone pulls out in front of you, you, you decide to travel through Atlanta. All sorts of things instantly blow us off course. In the book of Malachi, Israel's blown off course. They've got an oppressive government. They've got a plague of locusts. And they've got people that are just don't want to get off the pew. It hits. We look in our world today and we've got problems that are far beyond our pay scale. And they change everything. From the changing of the economy to a presidential election to changes within our community. They blow us off course, but not God. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatsoever he pleases. No obstacle can divert his path. No opposition can divert his course. Paul says, who can resist his will? Who has the power to stay his hand? Who does? Who can force God to change? What God decrees, God does. What God promises, he keeps. Does this not bring us a large amount of comfort today? When George Matheson had declining vision and a deserting fiancé, he wrote these words. O oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may be richer and fuller be. Why does he rest his weary soul in God? Because God will not change. To paraphrase Psalm 102, the world's love will perish but God will remain. The world's riches will perish, but God will remain. The world's health will perish, but God will remain. This world itself will perish. God will remain. How does the unchangeableness of our God affect us on a day-to-day -day level? We've got the concept down. He doesn't change. He's powerfully, perpetually perfect. What does that mean for me? What does that mean for you? I think we should answer this with the same two headings Malachi addresses in our passage. What do we do when we're sinned against? What do we do in times of suffering? What do we do? One, let us understand that a delay in judgment does not mean God has changed. A delay in judgment does not mean God has changed, therefore we should take sin seriously. You may remember Psalm 73, Asaph is the worship leader at the First Presbyterian Church of Jerusalem. And he's looking out at the world, and he's seeing the wicked, they got fine cars, Beautiful cars, lovely cars, their houses are exquisite, they're going on vacation every weekend. They, are not ha they never go to the doctor. They are in perfect shape. Their kids are perfect. Everything seems to be going exactly their way. And here's Asaph, he's driving a beat up Pinto, and everybody's on his case, and he can't understand why it is that he's following God and everything goes wrong, but these wicked people, everything seems great. And what does he say in Psalm 73? He says, I went into the temple of the Lord, and when I set my eyes on who God was in his person, everything made sense. And then he comes to that faithful conclusion to put a riff on, on a famous book. He looked at the wicked and he said, they're having their best life now. But notice what made the change for Asaph. He put God in the right place. 
He put his faith in God's righteousness. That the God who imputes the, right, the righteousness of Christ to those who believe will also execute his righteous wrath on those who don't. And you may say to me, Zach, I've been sinned against a lot, but I don't see any lightning bolts coming from the sky. Well, let me tell you a story you wouldn't believe. When I was a child, I got a spanking. I know, it's hard. My dad only spanked me one time because that's all it took. I didn't need him to remind me every day of the message that was clearly delivered. In the same way, God's not opening the ground as he did in the book of Joshua. Uh, I've yet to see God strike somebody dead for lying how much they put in the offering plate like in Acts chapter 5. But what I do have is a perpetual reminder in the cross of Jesus Christ that God takes sin seriously. That he punished the sin of his people in his son Jesus Christ upon that cross. And that cross is a reminder to me that no sin will go unpunished. It is either punished in Christ or by Christ. But God will execute his righteousness. I don't have to get even. I don't have to manipulate I don't have to play the political game that Israel plays in 70 AD and gets wiped off the map. I don't have to one-up. I can do, as Robert faithfully said this morning of Acts 16, what did Paul and Silas do? They praised and they prayed. And they let God take care of the rest. Did he? Yes. Just because there's a delay in judgment does not mean God has changed. Lastly, a duration in affliction does not mean God has changed. Just because the affliction lasts a long time does not mean God has stopped loving us. In Job, it reads as if the affliction was very short, and then everything was restored double. That's how we'd like it, isn't it? But look at Jacob. Jacob suffered to the very end of his life. Did God love Jacob less than Job? No. The duration of affliction does not mean God's love for us has changed. He speaks of refining with fire. This is the same language Peter uses where he tests the genuineness of our faith. He says this faith that has gone through affliction is more valuable than gold, even much gold. Thomas More says, the purer the gold, the hotter the fire. The whiter the garment, the harder the washing. Tell me, how do we respond to affliction? Do we run away from it, seeking solace in friends who will grow weary of our complaining? Do we fill it in with entertainment or busyness or work? We're trying to find joy in these things. No, in times of affliction, no matter how long it lasts, let us always stay near to the cross. We will find no comfort keeping one foot in the Bible and one foot in the world. As someone said to me recently, do you know what you get when you mix vanilla ice cream and mud? Mud. When you mix God's faithful, unchanging promises with this changeable world, all you will get is mud. Let us instead be as Charles Spurgeon who said, I thank God for the winds and the waves that blow me onto the rock of ages. And every sin he will forgive, he will never forsake. In every temptation, he will deliver, but he will never disappoint. In every affliction, no matter how long or how deep, he will stand and keep his promises. My friends, you have an unchangeable God to stand by you. If you're not a believer this morning, I warn you, his justice does not change. Neither does the narrow gate. It remains wide open for all of those who place their faith 
and the unchangeable God and the unchangeable righteousness of Jesus Christ. But there will be no change in his judgment if you pass it on. For those of us in this room that have been sinned against or are suffering, guess what? That's every single one of us. You have an unchanging God standing by you. The world may change, but our God will not. Let us take him by the hand and let him lead us to the sifting sands of this age. Church, would you?